All right, well, we're live. So uh, welcome to the Victory Farm Center for the Humanities um, special talk on Heidegger's question concerning technology. We're being joined by Dr. Ian Thompson from University of New Mexico. Um, and well, yeah, so we're about to do two things. One, we're going to uh, I'll take turns introducing ourselves. But first, I will just say a couple things as introduction to Dr. Thompson, and I'll kind of let him take the helm and, and continue with the introduction because what I have is not very comprehensive, but I will say that he wrote one of the best um, articles on Heidegger um, that I've ever stumbled upon on uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's um, page for Heidegger's aesthetics. It's about 30 pages long, and it's excellent. It really helped me a lot on my thesis, and I... Uh, as a fanboy, I've read basically all of your essays. Haven't gotten to any of your books yet. Um, some of those essays though, I've read a lot. And um, actually, yeah. So anyway, uh, it's, so it's just it's fantastic to have like one of the one of the leading um, Heideggerians out there joining us. Um, and I'll, I'll so I'll turn this over to you so you can kind of say a few more words about your background and your research and stuff like that. But rather than kind of presume, you can go ahead and just ask what you would like us to say about ourselves when we go around after you've introduced yourself. Thanks. So you go by Dave? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Well, that's, that's nice of you. Um, yeah, that, the piece from the Stanford Encyclopedia is um, an early version of chapters two and three of my book, Heidegger, Art, and Postmodernity. So you've actually read a big chunk of that book without knowing it. So uh, that's, it's, um, if you want to read the revised and improved version, uh, read the book. In fact, the book has something that they made me cut from the online thing, that um, they made me cut it for complete bullshit copyright reasons having to do with technology that we can get into. It's kind of amusing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know who. Just go around, maybe go around and, and just tell me who's there and and what you guys are hoping to um, hear from me to give me some sense to orient my remarks. I obviously uh, have more than a few things to say about the question concerning technology, so I can talk about that for hours. So it might help if um, you guys <laughs> tell me maybe some of the um, unanswered questions that have come up in your discussion so far that sort of thing and then maybe I can see if any of those I can push a little further into the uh, into the unanswered see if they're unanswerable or if they have answers awesome I guess I'll lead off um, so I'm Dave Dave McCarricker Dave Jonathan McCarricker is the full name Dave Jonathan is the name on Facebook and that's how most people know me so um I, uh, I'm an adjunct to Boise State. Um, Brian and I are the co-founders of the center here. Um, we are basically, yeah, we're a center for the humanities and we're exploring alternative living learning communities while kind of practicing that. And we're doing that, you know, uh, th theoretically, um, largely through continental philosophy and poetry with kind of excursions into literature. And then we have guest appearances from other people. So our, our conversation we had on the question concerning technology a couple of weeks ago was a follow-up on being in time. We read that last summer, um, kind of, I don't know, 40 pages a week kind of a thing. Cool. All the way through. Um, Michael Downs was joining us for parts of that. I think Marilyn joined us for parts of that. Um, Josh, who's off camera right now, uh, is currently reading it in a class at Boise State. Um, there's a Heideggerian professor there who teaches political science and he teaches that through an honors section and it's fantastic. And really like being in time was, uh, what was probably like my, my first real call to conscience out of kind of my, uh, the paradigm that I was in beforehand. And so, uh, the thing I'll just say to, uh, for turning this off to, uh, to Bert is that, uh, I guess one of my big questions is about the style itself, the stylistic turn. I think that this is lecture based, but um, I, I'm, it doesn't seem like the same kind of um, phenomenology I'm used to. And I, 
I love this essay. I wrote it like six times, but I really do like, I'm just like, what is this? It, you know, it, all this stuff where he's, he's doing etymology and, 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 and it seems like some kind of hermeneutics. It doesn't really seem yeah. phenomenology because it kind of gets at this other level of, of the phenomena that's so far beyond our immediacy. So yeah, I want, I want to hear more about that. would be great. So. Okay. Um, I'm Bert. I, um, I got interested in philosophy about 40 years ago when I was, uh, a communist and we were Althusserian communists, which in the United States sort of meant we, we led a lonely existence. <laughs> I am uh, very lonely. Yeah. When people are wanting to know how much, what you like the most about Kim Il-sung, it's a strange world. And uh, I am uh, less familiar with Heidegger than uh, other people here. So in all reality, almost everything you could say will be deeply edifying. <laughs> right now I'm reading, uh, I, I've uh, committed myself to reading 20 pages of anything by Hegel a day, every day. Wow. And, That's not uh, easy. No, it's not. <laughs> Quite a while to get to the point where I, I imagine that it's comprehensible to me. Wow. Well, that you need a 60-hour day for that. <laughs> well, anyway, we're, I'm really looking forward to this, and uh, Good. thank you for being here. Um, my name is Brian Weeks. Like Dave said, uh, I'm one of the founders here, and I consider myself a poet in residence who dabbles lightly in philosophy. Um, and lightly, less, mean, lightly, lightly, mean, lightly meaning the first excursion into philosophy for him was reading being in time all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> well, boom. That's appropriate. Yeah. Or maybe I should, should, yeah, maybe instead of lightly the noob um, in the philosophy world and I feel like I'm kicking dirt most days. Uh, and I'm, I'm more than anything just excited to, to see where this conversation takes us tonight. I don't have any lead off questions at this moment. Well, you realize as the poet in, in residence, the heaviest responsibility falls on your shoulders. Right, I know. The saving power lies with you. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Uh, I'm Josh. I'm an undergraduate student on Distracted. You get something to swap in. Um, and I don't have much of an introduction. I'm excited for the discussion. And I would like to get it started as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, I got the essay. Eddie. Eddie. Yeah. I'll put a more comfortable chair. Do you want to be there? Yeah. Okay. Of course. It's just you never get Eddie on camera, so you know, I was like, well, there we go. I can do it. Um, see? Uh, what are we doing? Say hi. Introduction and asking, kind of, any, providing some questions, like where we're coming from with the text. <coughs> um, okay. Uh, it's been a while since I read it, so not a lot of textual questions except for, um, I don't know, I, I'm interested in ways of using Heidegger that don't, that, what are the solutions that might come to the, the things he's presenting that aren't fascism, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I only know the fascist ones. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, okay. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, me too. Me too. I'm um, trying to. I'm trying to avoid the fascist solutions as much as possible. <laughs> well, Not God. that easy. Not that easy in contemporary America. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sorry. one of the original members here, and I'm about to graduate from Boise State. Um, if I can make it through April, so. Right on. And then um, Eddie, this is off camera right here. Eddie, would you mind? Would you want to say, uh, introduce oh, yourself? See, see what we're gonna, yeah. oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. That didn't help, Eddie. I think I got. It. <laughs> You're still off camera. <laughs> you got to turn the camera a little. There he is. He's on the floor. Can you see him now? He's on the floor right. I can't. No, I, I wish I could control the camera. That'd be interesting. Eddie, wave at him. 
Now I can see um, half your face. Oh, uh, screen's cut off. Your screen's cut off. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is there a way to make it wider? <laughs> oh, yeah, there is. Okay, now I can see more. And you can move it back. Cool. That was an improvement. Cool. Oh, great. Was I also off camera? No. I was, it was just the right hand side. It was Well, my right hand side. Yeah, uh, my name is Eddie. Uh, I, I had a bachelor's degree in political science, um, emphasis in international relations. Uh, I'm interested in Heidegger's uh, technology, the question concerning technology, because uh, uh, I read uh, one book about uh, the concept of the political by Schmidt. He talks about that the 20th century is the the age of the technological domain. So, because we uh, 19th century was the economic domain, so we ended in a technological that we cannot. It's kind of a. Uh, uh, we we don't have a, a future domain so we're stuck there in the technological uh, that's why my interest in, in fire is what what's the essence of technology because Schmidt is talking about technological domain but it's kind of the name is everywhere in, in, in politics and economics Okay, right on. Well, if I, um, I studied a lot of Schmidt myself back in the day, so if I don't answer your questions along the way, remind me, because I, I do have some stuff. Those, those are difficult, deep questions, but I, I do have some things to say about them, so feel free to let me know if I, if I don't get to it. Okay, then we'll, we'll just go. So, by the way, Daniel, um, I muted you. Uh, just be, just kind of when you, you might not have realized I'd done it, so I just wanted to let you know that. Um, so kind of because if we have a lot of unmuted mics at once, there starts being like this feedback thing that gets chaotic. So uh, we'll just start with Marilyn and then move to the right on the screen. And so you basically just have to mute yourself, unmute yourself, talk, unmute, and then then remute. Should I do that too? I think that we can have two two going at once. It's probably better if I don't try and do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch anything. All right. Yeah. I could tell you horror stories from previous interviews. <laughs> Should I mute or unmute? Unmute. <laughs> you are unmuted right now. Okay. Um, hello. Hi, Daniel. Haven't seen you in a while. Um, I um, did my master's thesis on Heidegger. So I have a little bit of a background. He was actually one of the first philosophers that I explored once I started uh, getting into philosophy, uh, attempted being in time <laughs> when I was pretty much a novice, failed, tried again a couple years later, um, then finally like started to get it after circling around it, reading some of his other works. And um, my main area of study um, has been ancient philosophy, actually, uh, particularly Neoplatonism mm. and uh, that time period. Um, late antiquity and um so i've read this essay a number of times and oh i forgot to mention i have your philosophies of nature after oh, that, that's not me <laughs> that's not you that's just some other fool who spells, who spells his name wrong like me oh okay. I, think there's three, I think i think there's three of us ians there's another one too okay there's at least three <laughs> I've never met that guy. I know the other Ian. Sorry, no, that guy might be a brilliant philosopher. I, I don't know his work very well. I've seen his name around. Okay. But looking forward to the discussion. But if you have any questions about his work, I probably can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, that's all I have. But I am interested in Heidegger's relation to Schelling, if that's what it's about. Um, I think he definitely touches upon that, yeah. Okay.
than the Lego person. I don't know who that is. Oh, that's me. Hello, guys. My name is Michael Porter. I'm a friend of Tegan's. I don't have a deep formal uh, background in philosophy, uh, mostly coming from a background in Marx. I've read uh, most of Being in Time. I've listened to a couple of lectures on this essay concerning uh, technology, and uh, it's great to be here. I don't have much more to say. Cool. I'm just dealing with the, the, a beautiful sunset, which I'm, I'll put the window down as when the sun itself has gone down, so it's not blind, blindingly bright. Daniel. Daniel, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Can you unmute <laughs> You're you Look, I got Daniel, don't touch anything. Just stop, Just hold on. I got you. Don't you worry about anything. <laughs> oh, and now I muted you. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No worries. What? Maybe, maybe I can't actually do it. Look. Maybe we should just get going. I'm real, I didn't realize there were quite so many people here. And I don't know how long you guys have, but it's 7.22 now on my time. So we're going to use all our time just um, introducing ourselves. Okay, well, Daniel McKay's a really cool guy, and Tegan's really cool. He looks and, cool. Uh, Tegan looks cool, and that's da Dazine there. <laughs> Michael Downs. Michael Downs. This Michael is Matt. Here. Is Michael oh. here? Ma Matt just yeah, I'm here. Cool, man. I want to hear your voice, but I can't. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been into Heidegger for many years now, Burke, and uh, really influential. When I first started studying Heidegger, I studied Dreyfus and I read all the different commentaries, Mark Rathall and William Blattner and all them. And uh, at this point, I just recently finished up a certificate for research and practice. And I've kind of moved on in Lacan, Deleuze, Zizek, Baudrillard. Heidegger still kind of out of how I see things. And so always happy to return to Heidegger and get some new insights. Right on. Are you the guys trying to beat um, Donkey Kong? Yeah, yeah, that's me. That's yeah, sweet. <laughs> Facebook friends for sure. Yeah. Do you live around, where do you live? I live in Raytown, Missouri, right outside of Kansas City. Okay. Uh, yeah. I thought maybe around here because they just had the um, world the world Galaga Championships were in Santa Fe like two days ago. I, I was watching the stream last oh, okay. weekend. It was awesome. <laughs> so the week before they had the the Kong off uh, out in California, and hopefully next year I'll be able to go compete at the Donkey Kong awesome. tournament. That's awesome. All right, well, shall I start talking about Donkey Kong or get into the question concerning I, I, <laughs> Well, Daniel can't unmute, and, but, but I, if, if any of the three people besides Daniel who haven't said anything had a question, I'm just going yeah. to we turn it over. Yeah, you're the only one who really asked a question. Well, you and um, my, my colleague over there asked about Schmidt, but you're the only one who asked a question about Heidegger. <laughs> I think. Uh, okay, here, I'll ask a couple more questions. Uh, if you could kind of unpack, I, I know this is crazy, uh, absurd yeah, no. to ask, but the Heidegger's conception of truth, that's pretty fundamental here. What's awesome. he doing with those four causes? How does he develop this thesis? And really, is is the style is it, of, of its unpacking convincing to you? Um, does it feel too contrived? If not, why not? I, We'd love to hear about all that. Okay. Sweet. I'm trying to think about how to broach the question concerning technology via Donkey Kong. <laughs> I think I could do it, but all right. So <clears throat> I, I, let me start with truth because that's very basic and fundamental in Heidegger's sense, primordial or sprungliche, like uh, originary, gets to the origin. So for Heidegger, it's very important to be original, not in the sense of like being first, 
he thinks like the obsession with being first comes out of modern philosophy with its uh, view that the self can be understood as a subject and originality becomes a kind of subjective flag planting, ego maintenance. He's not into that. He's into um, getting back in touch with the continually inspiring sources. That's the sprung, the spring, and ursprung, the fundamental spring. So when he talks about something being original or primordial, he means it's enduringly inspiring um, and as deep as you can get. So radical in the sense of getting all the way down to the root, like a radish, the rad. Um, so truth for him is radical, original in that sense. And it's if we understand it not as correspondence of a sentence to a state of affairs the way we do today, but instead as the Greeks did as aletheia or unconcealment, disclosure, unforgottenness. So ah, Lethea. Lethe is the river of forgottenness that your soul would drink from before you were reborn. Ah in Greek is the alpha privative, un or not. So ah, Lethea is unforgetting or unconcealment. So it's truth as disclosure, as something coming out of dark, the darkness into the light. So the most important thing to get there is that um, earth and world in the origin of the work of art the essential tension of earth and world is just aletheia. The ah is world and the lethe is earth. So when he's talking about earth and world as the essential tension at the heart of truth, he's trying to give us a phenomenological sense for his understanding of this deeper, richer understanding of truth, which he thinks is implicit in our contemporary understanding of truth as correspondence. So if I say, um, this sentence, we are conversing on some sort of video chat platform, is true or false. I mean that that sentence describes a state of affairs that may or may not obtain. So there's something in reality that that sense is trying to get at. That is, there's some way in which things are or show themselves. So from Heidegger's perspective, and this is what Rathal is quite good on, it's not that he's saying that um, aletheia, truth as aletheia and truth as correspondence are incompatible. He's saying truth as disclosure is presupposed by truth as correspondence. But that truth as correspondence is a much narrower, much more specific understanding of truth. It's like a scalpel compared to the much broader, wider understanding of truth that the Greeks are working with. So um, that's truth. Why is that important for technology? Because technology is for him fundamentally a truth. It's a, it's a mode of revealing, as he puts it on the first pages of the, the question concerning technology. I was just re-looking at the essay briefly, but it's, a, um, it's on page 12 of the, do you guys have the green book? Is that the one you're using? Oh, using basic writings. All right, sorry, I don't, I don't I didn't look it up in there, but it's um, how many pages in? Looks like it's about eight pages in. It's the section that starts, but where have we strayed to? And then the second paragraph is, technology is therefore no mere means. Technology is a way of revealing. Eine Weise des Entbergens. Entbergens is a version of uh, disclosure. So he's saying it's a way of truth. So for us, technology is a way in which things come out of hiddenness into the light. It's something like the fundamental nature of truth for us today, technology. So, and he thinks coming to appreciate technology as the way reality happens for us is absolutely crucial for getting out of the danger of it and into like a salvific, poetic, free relationship to it. So I could talk more about that, but the, it's it's important to understand sort of the way he's coming at truth and technology are both phenomenological. You were asking about the stylistic turn that goes on between being in time and, and the question concerning technology. And um, that's what's known in the popular literature as the turn. And it used to be by far the most uh, controversial topic in Heidegger studies. What's the nature and reasons for the turn? And then periodically, the question of Heidegger's Nazism would pop up and eclipse that question. And we're in one of those periods right now. I'm actually teaching a grad seminar on the Black Notebooks. 
And um, I find that's, I've been working on that since my first book. To me, that's a very important issue. And um, nonetheless, the question of the turn is also very important. And there's always kind of a scholarly Das Mann that just <laughs> unthinkingly follows the latest trends. So the old view was that, was that the turn was just basically a turn or a transformation in Heidegger's style. And then the new view, which came out about 10 years ago, was it's not really a, a change in Heidegger's style so much as it is a, a change in um, being. It's something like something being does, being turns. And that's right, but <laughs> I can explain that. But the two are connected. I talk about this in um, Heidegger art and postmodernity. If you look up the turn in the index, there's a lot of specific references to it. It's basically, um, there was a horizon, a phenomenological horizon that Heidegger didn't yet glimpse in being in time that opens up for him starting in about 1929 when he starts talking about the nothing. That idea of the nothing as what's beyond the being of entities, that's a horizon he couldn't really countenance. I would say it's a repressed, to use the Lacanian Freudian language, it's a repressed horizon in being in time. There's, there's moments in being in time when he's aware that he quotes Kant saying, be careful with ontological issues, there's always another horizon beyond this horizon. So he's aware of the danger that when he's talking about the being of entities and looking for fundamental ontology in being in time, that there might be something more fundamental than fundamental ontology, but he doesn't really take that issue seriously enough in being in time. And that's what prevents being in time from being finished. It's what stops him from ever being able to complete that text. So the most influential, most uh, in, uh, important philosophy work of the 20th century is an unfinished text that fails to deliver on its central thesis statement, which is that it's going to deliver a fundamental ontology. It never does. And it's very important to understanding Heidegger to understand why he couldn't deliver a fundamental ontology, why he couldn't ever explain what the being of entities was. And the reason basically in a nutshell is because he came to see that there was something beyond the being of entities. He first called it the nothing, then the earth, then Zion with a Y, then the fourfold being as such. He has many different names for it. And that's important why he does, we can get into that. Those are all different phenomenological ways of attempting to get readers to experience what's beyond the being of entities. And why is that important? Because he comes to recognize that there's a series of historical transformations in our way of understanding the being of entities. And the question becomes, what makes that possible? What makes it possible for our understanding of the being of entities to change over time? And the way I like to think about this, there's sort of three basic possibilities. We could be getting it right. That's the progress narrative. We could be falling away from the truth. That's the regress narrative that being in time is kind of working under. And then there's what I call the excess narrative, which is there's something beyond the being of entities that always exceeds it, that is only ever partly captured by any historical way of understanding the being of entities. So we today, live in a technological understanding of the being of entities. And um, <laughs> can you guys hear me okay? Is the light okay? Is it too bright? Yeah. Okay. All good. Okay, I like how when you talk, it like flips over to you. That's kind of cool. Um, so he comes, he, he becomes for, you know, Heidegger's a philosopher, he's interested in foundations. But his own quest for foundations leads him to realize that the foundations of intelligibility are not the kind of things that can be recaptured once and for all. They're rather um, something that we have to learn to be attuned to in a way that um, opens us up to their, their meaningfulness rather than tries to freeze them once and for all. So that's kind of um, to segue from truth to phenomenology. There's some people who like to say, Later, Heidegger's not doing phenomenology, but he is. He's, it's a misreading of Heidegger to think he's not doing phenomenology. He's doing phenomenology from beginning to end. And for him, phenomenology is always hermeneutic. That is, it's always interpretive. So in the middle works, the phenomenology is being interpreted through texts, specifically, usually the texts of metaphysical philosophers, the great philosophers from uh, Plato to Nietzsche, but also, um, and the pre-Socratics who are sort of pre-metaphysical usually, but also through the great poets who in his view um, 
embody an ontology in their poetry, usually not a metaphysical ontology, but a um, postmodern ontology. That is an ontology that helps us begin to understand what it would like to um, experience ourselves in a non or post technological way. So questions about uh, any of that? <laughs> I'll be right back. Let, I can hear you. I'm just going to turn the light on. So does that make sense? Shall I continue? Yes. All right. I like that. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So, so Heidegger's stylistic turn, there's actually a moment in his black notebooks where he um, decides very deliberately that he needs to start employing a more poetic style. One of the things that's fascinating about the black notebooks is there's something like Heidegger's working um, journals. So he's writing in them all his thoughts about um, the, the world around him, but also about his own philosophy and where it needs to go. So he comes to believe as he as he comes to recognize that being can't be captured once and for all. It's not something that can be um, offered up in a fundamental ontology, but is instead something like an inexhaustible or seemingly inexhaustible source of meaningfulness for us finite mortals, at least. I raised the question elsewhere about whether an immortal being could ever exhaust being as such. <laughs> And it's, it's possible. Heidegger talks about um, the finitude of being, but when he talks about the finitude of being, he's usually talking about the finitude of the being of entities rather than the, the finitude of being as such. That's an interesting issue, um, which we can discuss. But the crucial thing to see that almost everybody who works on technology in Heidegger misses is that you can't really understand his critique of technology without understanding what he means by ontotheology. Because for him, our current technology is grounded in an ontotheology. That is what he calls the technological understanding of being. And that's what he's um, worried about. He's not worried about particular technologies, except insofar as they are symptoms or expressions of a technological understanding of being. So what he's really worried about is a nihilistic way of viewing or experiencing reality. And he thinks that nihilistic way of experiencing reality comes to us out of metaphysics. Specifically, it comes to us out of what he calls Nietzsche's unthought metaphysics of eternally recurring will to power. So on Heidegger's rather controversial reading of Nietzsche, Nietzsche, who of course dedicated his whole life to trying to get out of metaphysics and nihilism, was secretly un unrecognized by himself, except in certain passages that Heidegger likes to quote. Um, a Nietzsche was secretly a, both a metaphysician and a nihilist. He was a metaphysician because he had an understanding. He had, in a word, he had an ontotheology. So ontotheology is a, an attempt to get at the foundations of reality in two ways at once. If you think of reality as a beach ball, ontotheology is an attempt to get to the innermost core and the outermost perspective on the beach ball at the same time. The onto is the innermost core. It's like the attempt to get to the fundamental particles or super strings or whatever the tiniest little stuff everything else is made out of. That's ontology. We're still doing that in physics. Um, theology is an attempt to like take up the God's eye perspective on the universe, to step outside everything that is, take up this view from nowhere, as Thomas Nagel calls it, and grasp all of reality from the outside in. Now, ever the, that those two ways of seeing reality ontologically and theologically, I argue that they come out of Thales and Anaximander in the Western tradition. Thales understands the arche as water. That's to say everything's made out of water. That's to look for the fundamental thing that everything else is made out of. Whereas Anaximander understands the arche or the ground of reality as aperon, the infinite or the indefinite. So that's the first, the he's stepping outside of all created uh, entities and trying to say where they come from. They come from an undifferentiated source to which they return when they die. Plato comes along in Heidegger's view, and he, he does what I call retroactive Siamese twinning on these two ways of trying to think about the arche or the foundation of all things. 
he puts them together. So for Plato, the forms are both um, the ontology. They're, but if you think of um, the form of beauty in the symposium, it's both what all the different kinds of beautiful things have in common. So beautiful clouds, beautiful artworks, beautiful bodies, beautiful, you name it. They're all beautiful insofar as they implicitly participate in the, in the form of beauty. So that's the ontological. But the forms are also theological in Heidegger's sense in that, for example, the form of beauty is the most beautiful of all beautiful things you can possibly encounter or experience. So it's the highest possible embodiment or manifestation of beauty. And it's something outside this world that gives this world its meaningfulness. So it's theological as well. Heidegger traces the, the genealogical story whereby the ontotheology or metaphysics, for him, metaphysics is ontotheology. That's why he says Plato is the first metaphysician, even though you have ontology in Thales and, and you know, uh, theology in, in Anaximander, et cetera. Plato is the first to bring those two different ways of understanding reality together in one. And then um, that continues all the way down. Here, let me hang this up. Sorry. Um, Plato's the first one to bring these two ways of understanding uh, the RK or the foundation together, the innermost and the outermost, the microscopic and the telescopic, uh, inside out and the outside in. And um, when metaphysics works as onto theology, it temporarily provides a foundation for our understanding of what it means to be. So as onto theology, metaphysics tells us what isness is. That is, it tells us what it means for anything to be. Well, everything is. So when you change our understanding of what isness itself is, you end up changing our understanding of everything. So although Heidegger is dedicated to leading us beyond metaphysics, he thinks that metaphysics plays this absolutely crucial role in establishing the fundamental and ultimate conceptual parameters on what it, uh, on intelligibility, on basically what it means for something to be and what matters. That's why he's so obsessed with metaphysics. And he also thinks that's the great danger of Nietzsche's onto theology is that when Nietzsche um, understands reality as essentially will to power and ultimately eternal return or the eternal return, Heidegger understands eternal return as the eternal return of the same. I think um, that's a misreading of Nietzsche. We can get into that too. I'm with Deleuze on, it's actually the eternal, Nietzsche really meant the eternal return of every possible variation. Hence the eternal return of the same, but sandwiched between the eternal return of every other different world. So the world where you know your parents don't meet, the world where you get hit by a car when you're not, and the world where right every possible reality will happen. So this one will happen an infinite number of times. But Nietzsche doesn't mean that only this possible world will happen. That's what the animals say in Zarathustra, and, and he Zarathustra criticizes that view as a kind of elevator music, like a, a massive simplification of his own deepest truth. So anyway, when you put these two, the, the ontological and the theological together, you get the technological understanding of being. And Heidegger doesn't think Nietzsche is just making it up. He, he, I think he recognizes that Nietzsche is, like all great uh, thinkers, fundamentally receptive to um, a reality that's transforming outside the experience of his own mind or thoughts. So Nietzsche is reading a lot of Darwin, or at least um, Darwinians, He's, he's reading a lot of science. Um, he's interested in, in Adam Smith. And um, in chemistry, this view of, of all things is made up of just competing forces is taking hold. I think it's Maxwell. In um, uh, Darwin, it's the view that like the essence of life is in neither the lion nor the gazelle, but in the competition between the lion and the gazelle that leads to this kind of arms race between life forms that keeps life itself alive. That's will to power in, in uh, Adam Smith. It's, you know, this idea of the invisible hand that if you just unchain supply and demand, the market will grow at the maximum possible rate. So all around Nietzsche, this view that, um, that rea this is nihilistic, don't get too happy. <laughs> it's uh, all around Nietzsche, uh, this view of reality as nothing but will to power is taking shape. And Nietzsche is just the guy who says, 
that's not true only of living things, biological things like Darwin thought. That's not just true of chemical things like Maxwell or whoever thought. And that's not just true of economic things like Smith thought. That's true of all things. It's an ontological truth about the nature of being. And if you play out, that's what it means to be a thing. And if you play out things in time, they unfold ultimately as eternal return. That's the closest Nietzsche says in his notebooks that the world of endless becoming comes to being. In, a, in probably the most important passage for Heidegger, which we should come back to about the pinnacle of metaphysics that occurs 2,000 2, feet above humanity and 200 years ahead of time. I don't know if you've read Heidegger's Nietzsche. Yeah, Heidegger's Nietzsche lectures, but they are the best. <laughs> Please. Head on mute. Oh, okay. Um, just, this is a really quick clarification point. Do you say ontological plus ontio, onto theological equals technology for Heidegger? Yeah, ontological plus theological. Oh, okay, thank you. Equals onto theological. Which is equal, technology. Equals metaphysics. So oh. our contemporary metaphysics, we're all, we're all Nietzscheans. I like to tell my Christian students who don't want to read Nietzsche that they're, they're Nietzscheans, like it or not. That <laughs> we're all Nietzscheans in the sense that when push comes to shove, most of us will explain the being of something as composed of competing forces. That's yeah. not, it's funny. I'm going to take this opportunity to make an announcement for those who didn't know, but we're going to be joined by a preacher friend from Texas um, uh, at the end of the month who owns all the works of Nietzsche and thinks that he's the best thinker to have ever lived. And he's going to be coming and he's going to share a lecture on why he thinks that Nietzsche's so important for everyone, including Christians, to read. Well, he's right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Interesting, if you go to Nietzsche meetings, they're all preachers. <laughs> Nietzscheans are preachers. They're like weird atheistic preachers. I don't know what Heideggerians are. We're just crazy semi-schizophrenics or something. Poets, <laughs> poets who uh, couldn't make it as poets, I don't know. Um, phenomenologists, they call us. <laughs> Environmental sensitives too damaged by the technological world to uh, work out in the sun. So, so yeah, the, the crucial that. point, let me just finish the thought. The crucial point is that uh, when Nietzsche understands reality as eternally recurring will to power, that's his ontotheology, his unthought metaphysics, the thought behind all his thoughts. So Nietzsche is a metaphysician for Heidegger because he's got an ontotheology. That is, he understands reality as essentially will to power and ultimately eternal return. And what it means to think of isness as eternally recurring will to power is to say that everything is made of nothing but forces coming together and breaking apart with no goal beyond the maximum perpetuation of those forces. And that view is in framing. So when you think of reality as eternally recurring will to power, you're in framing it. It's turning all things into bestand, which is uh, standing reserves, the typical translation of that. I, following Dreyfus, call that resources. It's just stuff on standby to be optimized, or as I, I often put it, the optimization imperative, as he says in uh, the question concerning technology, is get the most for the least. It's Donald Trump, the art of the deal. Get the most for the least. Stick it to the other guy. Get as much as you can while giving the, the, as little as you can. That's our technological age. Trump is the president of inframing. He's our technological president. We, got, you know, we have a president who rather perfectly embodies everything that Heidegger thought was wrong with technology, that the destruction of quality, the quantification of quality. The, you know, so people, um, there's fascinating passages in the Black Notebooks that seem to be exact critiques of um, Trump basically 80 years, 80 years before, but they're, and, and for Heidegger, they're critiques of Americanism. Heidegger's no, no fan of America. He didn't, he, you know, he didn't really know much about America, except that we, we kicked his country's butt in the war and he wasn't too happy about that. So, uh, but you know, he says where the greatest danger is, the saving power also grows. For him, the greatest danger is Americanism. We are kind of the highest embodiment of technological, of the technological understanding of being. So it makes sense that the salvific understanding of being that he saw, he sees as the flip side of inframing would come to fruition very clearly in America. That is, he says things like, uh, inframing is the photographic negative of in owning. 
in his uh, late lectures. That is, uh, to understand reality as nothing but meaningless stuff coming together is seen otherwise to recognize being as the source of meaningfulness. So I mentioned, this takes a little explaining, but I mentioned earlier that Heidegger's got this passage in Nietzsche where Nietzsche writes in his notebooks after he has his Zarathustra experience where he's on the shore of Lake Sils Maria and, and he, I think he, as Klosowski says, he he's, has a kind of psychotic break and he, he remembers his future. He thinks he now knows what's gonna happen to him for the next prolonged period of time. He goes home and he spends a lot of time trying to figure out how he can make this mystical vision of his own future compatible with science. That's what the notebooks are filled with. How can I vindicate eternal return using naturalism and science? And, and he, you know, he has this kind of famous, Nietzsche has these famous ideas about, well, if you have finite space, finite matter and infinite time, then every possible pattern will repeat. And there's kind of interesting objections to that, but he's like trying to make eternal return a naturalistically plausible thesis. And what's interesting for Heidegger is uh, this moment where Nietzsche says, uh, it's sort of the highest pinnacle of his thought. He writes on, on the page of his own black, Nietzsche's own black notebooks. He writes, um, uh, you guys just all disappeared. I'm looking at a giant black screen now, um, which is weird for me. Come back. <laughs> Where'd you go? Anyway, I guess it fits. So he writes uh, the, this pinnacle of, um, of metaphysics in Nietzsche's understanding of all things as eternally recurring world of power. It's the highest uh, embodiment of nihilism. But as Derrida pointed out, a pinnacle is like a mountain peak that looks down both slopes. So it's not just the... the there you are. It's not just... The, it's, you know, you guys have a we got booted for some reason. So did you hear what I just said or not? No, if you could go back about 30 seconds. I'd Technology's be trying to stop me from uh, transcending it from within. Yeah, so uh -huh. the crucial thing, it's, it's literally the crucial pinnacle of Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche. It's this idea that the uh, enowning is the photographic negative of uh, inframing, or the event of meaningfulness is just the inverse of um, the most nihilistic way of taking things. So the pinnacle of nihilism is Nietzsche's view for Heidegger of that being is nothing at all. Being is nothing but forces coming together and breaking apart endlessly. So Nietzsche on Heidegger's reading turns being, he dissolves being into nothing but becoming. It's just endless becoming, forces coming together and breaking apart. There's no, being is an illusion that we, temporarily limited beings impose on things with nouns, but it's a lie. Reality is not really like that. It's the truth and lie and extra moral sense stuff. So Heidegger's view is if you see this pinnacle as, um, you could label the pinnacle of metaphysics as being equals nothing. That's the highest consummation of nihilism, the idea that being is nothing. But if you see that the flip way, you invert it, then it's nothing is being. So for Heidegger, you're outside metaphysics and into what I call the postmodern, what Heidegger called the other beginning, when you see the nothing, not as nothing but endless force, but as the way in which that which is not yet a thing offers itself to us to be poetically disclosed. So it's the way in which reality continuously shows hints to us about what we might creatively disclose from it. So for Heidegger, the solution to getting out of the nihilism of the technological understanding of being is to invert it and see reality not as made out of nothing, but instead as composed of a nothing that is the way in which the not yet a thing beckons to us, calls for us to creatively disclose it, to act like midwives and bring it into being, which is for him what all art does. He says the essence of art is poetry, poesis, that is um, bringing into being. So we philosophers have to become poets in that sense. We have to become attuned to the possibilities of creative disclosure. Hence, all that stuff at the end of the question concerning technology where he sets up these two opposing modes of revealing, which are basically imposing, technological imposing, on the one hand, in which you know what you want, and you just try and impose that on the world, and creative disclosure, on the other hand, where you try and 
stay open to what the world is hinting or suggesting to you that you might um, help bring into being. It's for Heidegger that ladder that uh, if we can become attuned to the way in which reality makes these hints, we can then come to lead meaningful lives. I talk about this in uh, a paper I wrote recently on love, because I think love is a very powerful example of something that we can't just make happen, but that if we're open to it in the right way, it can come to inform our lives and give them meaning that endures over time, potentially. Sammy and I read that. It was a good paper. I love Thank you. So I was. Yeah, yeah. Again, I have this um, American habit of reading uh, horror stories as happy endings. But yeah, <laughs> there's there is. They both read it that way too. Hannah and Martin. It's not a very um, timely thing to find good stuff in Heidegger these days because, you know, we live under a kind of um, niche. Let's say authoritarianism, uh, and you know, Heidegger as a guy who at least seems to have fallen for Hitler for a year or two and fallen prey to a kind of authoritarianism, if not fascism, um, doesn't, he's not a very popular figure among my uh, anti-fascist and largely communist students. But in fact, if you look at Althusser and, and um, you know, the great French thinkers of the last generation, Deleuze, Foucault, uh, Derrida, Baudrillard, they were, Leotard, they were all deeply, deeply influenced by um, Heidegger. Even Butler, Judith Butler, who, you know, is thought of more as a Hegelian, well, her dissertation at Yale in philosophy was on Kojiev, and Kojiev's a Heideggerian Hegelian who, for whom um, death is the crucial moment of the master-slave dialectic. So he reads Hegel's master-slave dialectic from the phenomenology back through being in time's existential phenomenology of death. Mm. That was very important for that whole generation who was at his lectures. Well, and they were, yeah, they were all influenced by Could you know, actually Jeff. repeat that thing? Because I, I didn't compute it. What, what is Kojev? That? Yeah, what specifically you said Kojev did. So I, I sometimes try and think of like a contemporary continental philosopher that wasn't influenced by Heidegger profoundly. <laughs> and the only name that sort of comes to mind quickly is Butler. But I actually think if you realize that Butler's own founding dissertation was on Kojiev and Kojiev's influence in France, Kojiev is a Heideggerian Hegelian. The mm -hmm. Heideggerianism is the extreme emphasis that he lays on, the, on death as the crucial moment in the master-slave dialectic. So for him, this has kind of become very standard now, but for him, it's absolutely, for Kojiev, it's absolutely crucial that when these two primordial consciousnesses encounter each other in this weird state of nature scenario that Hegel's envisioning, that each one is willing to um, die rather than allow the other one to impose its consciousness on them. So the one who, it's a kind of, um, you, this is a simplification, but you might think of it as a kind of samurai moment where the one who's less attached to life wins in the sense of becomes the master. The other one says, um, all right, you win. I don't want to die. I'll accept your way of seeing things. And that starts up, that creates the master-slave dialectic. And then, as you probably know, in Hegel, the master's a dead end and the slave becomes the um, future as the positive, po the possible positive evolutions of self-consciousness come through the fact that the slave is working the world with his or her hands. He, he or she is experiencing the capacity to transform reality through labor. Hence Hegel's view of, of species being as labor. That's why for, for Marx, when the capitalist steals your labor, they're not just taking money out of your pocket. They are entfremdung. They're like, making you strange to yourself. They're estranging you from yourself. They're taking a part of you that you've put into the world and they're just taking that away from you. That's like the ethical oomph of Marx comes from that moment in Hegel where the, where the slave is the one who's the possible path toward what for Hegel is absolute knowledge. I mean, for Hegel, there's a different path forward out of the master-slave dialectic than there is for Marx, obviously. But um, Kojiev was very interested in that moment which is the moment that Hegel and Marx still share in common, the master-slave. And he was reading it through a Heideggerian lens. 
Dr. Thompson? Yeah. Uh, we just back up 30 seconds when we first started talking about whoever uh, loves or is attached to life, the, the samurai that's attached to life least wins. Uh, who exactly uh, can someone read to get more information about that? And has anybody ever done anything on game theory in that sort of dialectic? I don't know about game theory. That's a good one. I had a grad student, his name's Adam Bubin. He's a professor now. He was obsessed with um, death and samurais. Every pope, every paper he wrote for me was like Heidegger and the samurai, Kierkegaard and the samurai. So <laughs> it's Bushido, it's the philosophy of the samurai. And according to the Bushido, the, the samurai who's least attached to living lives. Like when the two samurai face off, the one who's afraid of dying dies. <laughs> Or the one who's more afraid of dying dies, supposedly. So it's this, and there's something very like that in Kojiev's master slave dialectic. It's what I was suggesting. And it's Kojiev. Kuch 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 I'll get I'll Alexander Kojiev. I'll get information about it. K O J E V E. Okay, thank you. And apparently, he, uh, I was just seeing something about Kristeva being accused of being a spy and uh, Kojiev, too, apparently. So. It's good. I mean, I'm a fan of the idea that all the great thinkers are um, deeply flawed human beings. I'm teaching a course on philosophy of literature right now where um, I, I'm looking at deconstructions of the hero in Watchmen, Hamilton, etc. And on the one hand, when you see your, your great heroes um, exposed for their feet of clay, you know, the statue tumbles and Nietzsche says, beware lest a statue slay you when you see the feet of clay. On the other hand, it brings your heroes back down to earth and makes them not some figure that you can't imagine ever living up to, but rather someone who now you, and with nobody knows your flaws better than you do, right? <laughs> so you can now see the hero as something you can be despite the fact that you're as flawed as anybody else. And the kind, you know, we live in these radically polarized times where people want to be righteous and be on one side that's got a monopoly on the truth. but. That's just not the way, nature of the way things work. Almost always, truth is on both sides in different combinations and mixtures. And as a result, people are complicated, amb ambiguous, and ambivalent beings. And even a figure as morally, ethically, politically, you name it, compromised as Heidegger can be incredibly um, profound in their philosophical understanding of things. And there's no, there's no figure who if you could turn the microscope on them, would not be flawed. Well, I, I can't think of any. As far as I know, there are none. Even like Mother Teresa turns out to have. <laughs> Fred Rogers. Fierce baggage, yeah. Well, Brian's whispering Jesus, but I, I, I'm saying, I don't know. Also, so we can't know about Jesus because he's so heavily in the fallen, guys. Yeah. Like, you just can't. True. <laughs> <laughs> Davy Crockett, all right? <laughs> if, if Jesus said everything that was attributed to Jesus, then Jesus was a bit of a jerk. Well, and, you know, the, I, think, I think the biggest highlight is Jesus isn't even his name. So, so how much do we actually know? Yeah, we're like, your name is, what, Lord or something? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love Nietzsche on Jesus. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, the Antichrist is still one of my very favorite books by Nietzsche. It's better under, it translates the anti-Christian because Nietzsche, it's a, basically a radical rereading of Christ as Nietzsche's own forerunner, as a kind of figure that Nietzsche can embrace. So Nietzsche thinks Christianity went off the rails with Paul, which is a pretty standard view in the continental world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, you were raising your hand? <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, I, I could have a question. If, Please, yeah. Um, so I, right now, the, the paper, like the capstone paper I'm trying to write is, I mean, it's still kind of like messy, but it's essentially, I'm using a lot of a rent and Kant, and it's like, how do you, um, how is judgment formed and you know, what's the sort of dimension of being, of existence that we should look to, to revitalize and repoliticize some of these depoliticized areas of life, not politics in the sense of, um, of like, uh, fracture or um, polemics. I'm trying to think. What's that, what's that word? Polemos. Yeah, polemics. Um, but politics in the sense of, like, coming together, appearing before each other and solving problems together, you know. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to say that it's within the aesthetic perceptive realm and I don't know. But so what, I guess what I'm interested in is not solutions as in like, you know, here's this problem, here's this question of being, and we need an ultimate final solution. Like that always seems to end badly no matter what theory you're in. Yeah. Um, but what, I don't know, because like, you know, Hannah Arendt has a fixation on natality and the new, and even I'm seeing that here uh, in your lecture on Heidegger, where it's, there's something about this attunement to nothingness and then, uh, you know, bringing things into being, like, what is that, what is sort of praxis or theory or whatever we're supposed to be doing or thinking to get out of this and framing? Like you said, it's like flipping it on its head, but I'd like to hear more about this way out, like the sort of like path outwards, you know, cause he says only a God can say this, but what does that mean? You know, like, Oh, that's great. And I wish I would have written down all those questions, but they're inter they're interconnected. And I think I can follow the, the, the thread. So let me start with what's it mean to say only another God can save us? Cause I think that's the single most widely misunderstood sentence Heidegger ever uttered. And it's his own fault. Um, in the Black Notebooks, he confesses to being a deliberately esoteric writer who says, I never give more than the superficies of my thinking in my public lectures, what I'm really doing, I don't tell people. So that makes him very different from your average philosopher who tries endlessly to explain themselves. Heidegger is trying to get people to see something for themselves. In that, he's more like Jesus, right? He's doing these exhortational kind mm -hmm. of mysterious things that for you to see the point yourself, you've got to experience it in your own way. You've got to make it your own. And that means bringing yourself to it. So there's no sort of pure Heidegger that you can get right or wrong. There's sort of you thinking what Heidegger left on thought in a way that takes it further. And that's what he always said when this guy I was friends with, Manfred Frings, tried to order a, a, organize a Heidegger conference in America. Heidegger declined as he did all invitations to come to America. But he said, don't call it a Heidegger conference because there's no Heideggerianism. You can't be a Heideggerian. Instead, you should dedicate it to thinking about whatever the issues in my, th in my thinking that are most provocative to you, to thinking those issues further than I thought them. He called that thinking my own thought. So when Heidegger says only another God can save us, what I show in my work is what he means by that is only another understanding of being can save us. For him, a God is something like a understanding of being that fundamentally shapes our whole historical world, what I call our constellation of intelligibility. So he believes that what can save us is a postmodern understanding of being. That is an understanding of being that doesn't understand it in the modern way that Descartes and Kant did as subjects standing over against objects that are meaningless and attributing all the meaning they have comes from subjects positing that meaning, nor in this Nietzschean late modern way at where subjects become just more objects to be optimized and controlled. We start turning the technologies that we develop for controlling nature back onto ourselves and genetically, cybernetically, psychopharmacologically, you name it, cosmetically, we're trying to optimize ourselves now. That's turning ourselves into bestand. So that's the late modern. The, the modern is subjects, subjects against objects. The late modern is subjects objectifying themselves and thereby turning themselves into just more resources. To get beyond the late modern into the postmodern is to understand being neither as objects for subjects nor as meaningless stuff, but rather, and this is the photographic negative moment, as being instances of a reality that they partly express but never exhaust. And this is, for someone who's into Plotinus, this is basically like saying there's a deep insight in this kind of Plotinian tradition where the idea that, uh, except that it's trying to shear off the otherworldly aspect of it and say something like that the fact that we can't fully express reality isn't because reality hides outside something we can experience in the noumenal or the transcendent domain. It's because reality offers too much to, a, to us. There's more than we can possibly uh, make into a stable, settled, once and for all permanent view of things. Whatever, it's more like Freud's view of the navel of the dream. Freud thought there's always a moment where 
dream interpretation comes to an end. Not because you can't figure out what it means, but because some symbol in the dream starts to mean everything. That's the Lacanian uh, point de caption. This, it's like there's a point where it means too much. That's the earth. Heidegger describes the earth in the origin of the work of art as an inexhaustible richness of simple modes and shapes. It withdraws because we can't bring all of that suggestive possibilities into the stable light of, a per, of our current world. But for Heidegger, and this is actually Arendt's critique of Heidegger, Arendt, Arendt said Heidegger's too future obsessed. He forgets about natality. He forgets about the past. And that's an interesting critique. I think in many ways she's right. But to see, this connects to your question, because Heidegger is saying um, we have to think about futurity. That it, futurity for him, Zukunft, is the to come. What's not here yet, but coming. It's on its way toward, uh, just a sec, it's on its way to uh, our current world. That's um, the inchoate glimmers or hints of what's not here yet. So in politics, that means being poetically open to new ways of understanding what it means to be a human, what matters, what are ethically important, that are taking shape in the marginal practices, in the streets, in the marches, in the classrooms, in the factories, wherever it may be, and helping to creatively bring those into the world. There's a really good book on some of this um, called Disclosing New Worlds, which uses Heideggerian ideas to try and understand um, politics. And there's a very good book on judgment by a guy named Wayne Martin. It's on judgment in Kant, Heidegger. He goes through the theme of judgment in about four different thinkers, five different thinkers. It's fascinating. Um, so Wayne Martin on judgment, and it's Dreyfus, Spinoza, and Flores disclosing new worlds. It's a great book. Fernando Flores was um, the uh, is was Allende's finance minister in Chile before um, the U.S. Uh, deposed Allende, and he came to America as a poor uh, immigrant. He'd been a political prisoner in Chile for like two years, came to America, got a PhD at Berkeley, got interested in Heidegger, made millions of dollars using Heidegger and computers, and, and out of his political, he was a, a senator in Chile later, out of his, out of his democratic work, um, he's uh, written this book. And the other really good book on this is Vadimo, actually. Gianni Vadimo, the, the great uh, Italian Heideggerian, who was the first gay Catholic member of the European Parliament, <laughs> wrote, a, wrote a book. It's called like Nihilism and Politics. And there's some very good chapters in there about how realizing that there's no final metaphysical solution to things is itself a positive solution that becomes a very powerful grounding for a radical openness and tolerance that he argues is exactly what we need in politics today. And I've tried to develop that. I've got a paper online called something like Heidegger's Postmodern Politics that tries to summarize kind of all of this in about 10 pages. If you want to oh, check that what out. Was the, the Vatimo book? Was there Vatimo, was it a book? Yeah. It's called, I think it's called Nihilism and Emancipation or something like that. I can go get it on my shelf and tell you the title, but you can find it. It's got like politics, nihilism, and emancip it's a book of essays. I teach it when I teach um, contemporary political philosophy. It's a great book. I, he's, Vadim and Rorty are, are very similar. They basically think um, late modernity is great. Heidegger's analysis is exactly right on. The only problem is he thought we need to get out of late modernity. <laughs> Instead, we just need to embrace the nihilism of technology for the incredible freedoms that it gives us. And I think that's a nice illustration of what Heidegger called the greatest danger. The greatest danger is that we'll become so fascinated and distracted by all the stimulating possibilities that technology opens up that we'll lose our awareness that something's being lost with the monopoly of this technological mode of revealing. It'll come to eclipse all other ways of seeing the world and we'll lose the sensitivity to the fact that anything's being lost. That's what he calls a double forgetting, where you forget and then forget that you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the oblivion, or, the oblivion or forgetting of being. This well, you mentioned. I was going Sorry, go ahead. No, no, uh, you. Well, you mentioned the greatest danger, and actually, I had a question uh, related to that, um, in terms of in the essay. You know, 
how does it tie in with the saving power? Like, how do you read that? <clears throat> you know, what, what is the relationship between the, this greatest danger as the yeah. essence of technology? So and- I'll give you the reference to um, my book. <laughs> this is my second book. This is, um, it's on art and postmodernity. And the seventh, I think it's the seventh chapter, is on um, the danger and the promise in Heidegger. It's the danger and the promise of technology. So for him, the greatest danger and the salvific promise are flip sides. They're two sides of the same coin. So when, when he said his favorite line, he quotes it from, it's the Herdlinian line about where the danger is, the saving power also grows from Patmos, this late hymn. The um, idea there is not like it's always darkest before the dawn, but that the darkest darkness seen otherwise is the dawn. Midnight seen through the right framework or the right lenses is the new morning, what he calls the other beginning. So that's what I was explaining as this idea that being equals nothing is the what he calls the fulendung, the consummation of metaphysics. But a fulendung is also like the point where the system um, reaches its culmination and leads beyond itself. Heidegger believes the only way out is through. You can't go back. He's this mystic in that sense. The only way out is through. If you're, if you're going through hell, keep going. So the only way out of the technological understanding of being is to push it to the point where it opens up into something else. So seeing the nothing that it takes being to be, not as nothing at all, but as the not yet a thing. The nothing is not an inert nothing. It's an active nothing. He talks about the nothing of the nothing. It's like the stone in the river that parted analytic and continental philosophy. When Heidegger talks about the nothing of the nothing, Carnap had a field day on, look how you know this meaningless metaphysical jargon has, has run amok, right? Uh, but for Heidegger, that's an absolutely essential idea that what is not yet a thing nevertheless impinges on us. It makes itself felt to us. We can sense it. It's, it enters into our intelligible worlds in ways, and, and we have to learn to be... Um, sensitive to the ways in which what's not yet here, futurity of the future, as he puts it, the to come, um, is on its way toward arriving. And he actually thinks, some people think, oh, Heidegger, he's, he's waiting for this God. He's, he's in like pass, uh, passive despair. He doesn't know if this God's ever going to come. No, Heidegger thinks the postmodern already came. It comes in Van Gogh, it comes in Herdlin, it comes in even in, um, van, in Nietzsche. For Heidegger, Nietzsche is a two-sided figure who's both the culmination of the of the entire history of the West thus far, and the beginning of the of the next age, the beginning of the next postmodern understanding of being, the post metaphysical or post ontotheological understanding of being as what informs and yet also overflows every possible way of making sense of it. So, where do you think we are today? You know, in in terms of has this. Uh... Uh- new dawn passed us by or you know is it still yet to come like what, what are your thoughts on yeah um technology? i think uh, i think heidegger is right that it's arrived but also right that it's never yet swept the globe so i re- i wrote recently wrote something called we've never yet been postmodern as a kind of re- rejoinder or play on on uh, bruno latour's we've never been modern I don't agree that we've never been modern. I think we're in late modernity where we're treating ourselves not as subjects controlling the object of world like in Descartes and Kant, but as just more objects to be controlled and optimized technologically. So nonetheless, there are moments in art, in love, in poetry, even in the technological domain, music, um, writing, where an experience of ourselves not as just meaningless stuff to be optimized uh, but instead, as uh, embodiments of moments that can't, the, the significance of which can't be fully expressed now, can't even be fully understood in the now, but instead requ- require what Baju called a kind of fidelity, um, a kind of enduring period where you stay true to your sense for that, your sense that something really important happened in that moment that you can't fully understand and you stay true to it by continuing to unfold it in your life. And then when you look back on your life, <coughs> you're coming to have unfolded the meaningfulness of that event be- shows up as what gave your life its meaning. This is what a rent said. This is what a rent means when she says at the end of her life, 
I was, you know, I went to go see you, Heidegger, and I was staying with Carl Jaspers, and he almost talked me out of visiting you. And on the morning of, I took a train to go see you, and thank God I did because um, that impulse to go see you saved me from committing the one unforgivable sin of my entire life by betraying myself. Meaning, she understood herself as someone who the meaning of her life was unfolded in. Um, developing the significance of the great uh, importance and originality that Heidegger had seen in her. Not in the way that Heidegger saw it. Heidegger was quite wrong in, the, in what he thought Arendt's genius was. But he was not wrong that Arendt was this amazing genius. And she, in the unfolding of her life, showed that that was true. She vindicated the significance that he, in her mind, had um, recognized in her. So, you know, it doesn't have to be erotic, I don't think. I think it, there's a lot of different ways this can play out. But that's, I think, a nice, clear example of what it can mean. No, I don't, I have, oh, go oh, ahead, Josh. No. I, 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 I want to just interject one thing, and that is that uh, to the friends joining us remotely, um, feel free to unmute yourself and, 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 and you know, cut in past us because otherwise we will hog it. <laughs> I think Daniel is. I finally have, have uh, figured out. Um, there was okay. one thing that's been haunting my mind, a, a couple of things, is the, the, the notion of, of the, the saving power and the point of no return. I see this kind of manifesting in um, like the Japanese, their fascination with robots. And they're actually one of Mary robots, and that the the I think that I, we're seeing like the highest form of of uh, of being, the truest is like the actual uh, robots being able to uh, obey commands a hundred percent. You know, uh, there and you can see it in like workforce replacement with robots. Um, that's one thing, and then the <laughs> other thing is I. I see. Can I can I address that and then ask me the other thing because that's that's fascinating and I'll forget your second thing if okay. you All come right. back on the second one. So sure. that's great. I love the idea that um, marrying and having sex with robots is the greatest danger. The um, <laughs> the what's the way I often try to think of it is what Heidegger is suggesting is the greatest danger is coming true insofar as we are no longer the subjects who are mastering and controlling the objective world, a la bacon and science and this stuff, but are treating ourselves as just one more thing to be mastered and controlled. So you can think of, you know, I, I like to tell my students, you know what university does the most drugs? What has the highest percentage of undergraduate students doing drugs? It's MIT. And it's because they're not using drugs as uh, recreation or entertainment, they're using it as performance enhancers. So if you think about using, you know, um, drugs to enhance your cognitive performance, drugs to like make you more relaxed for the test, this kind of thing. Imagine now uh, a technology that comes along and says, well, we'll make it so we'll implant this incredibly powerful uh, memory chip in your brain. So you'll never have trouble remembering another name, everything, every book you read, you'll have like a kind of permanent photographic recall. You're like, okay, that sounds great. I talk about optimizing my intellect. Let's do it. So hook me up. And then imagine that it has an unintended side effect of destroying your ability to see reality in any different way. That would be an explicit example of the technological mode of revealing, eclipsing all other modes through a kind of technological mishap. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to happen that way. You're right, it could happen through um, humans going extinct by ceasing to reproduce because I like the Father John Misty song where uh, waking up, what is it? Waking up with Taylor Swift every night inside the Oculus Rift. It's like where people are deciding that the virtual sex is so much better than actual sex. So unmessy, uncomplicated, not anxiety provoking, not having to deal with the messy reality of another human being that they're foregoing, Japan's leading the way on this, they're foregoing actually engaging with other physical human beings. And hence, I think Japan's the only first world nation where the population's shrinking. 
So you could imagine uh, as the technological gets better, this is what I call the problem of the happy and framer. The problem of the happy and framer is the person who says, the only problem within framing is it's not good enough. The virtual is not real enough. I can't yet have sex with my dream fantasies in the virtual space and I still have to like leave. Well, I haven't seen this new movie about, what is it, Ready Player One, but it looks like a kind of vision of an escapist virtual reality as replacing or becoming uh, it's what Baudrillard called the triumph of the simulacra, where the virtual becomes better than the real and people come to prefer it to the real. These are versions of um, the uh, greatest danger. Baudrillard talked about the uh, grand delete, which is the vision behind the Matrix movies, where the computers, we give, you know, we give birth to AIs, the AIs realize um, that not because of a war, that's a simplification of Baudrillard, but the AIs realize that um, as long as humans are blogging and take Instagram, Snapchatting, they're creating all this new information that then these AIs have to organize. So instead, they just organize all the information, delete the humans, and then they realize the most clean solution is just to delete themselves. So they un end up unplugging themselves. That's Baudrillard's vision of where technology is heading. And it's another kind of greatest danger thing. What all of those dystopian scenarios miss is Heidegger's radically Janus faced two sided view that the darkest darkness seen otherwise is the hope. In other words, that the crucial thing is to learn to see um, this nothing as the not yet, as the future. I just gave a talk at the um, Bombay Beach Biennial, this kind of crazy, wild, dystopian art festival out in LA or in the on the shores of the Salton Sea. And um, my talk was, the theme of the conference was um, God's silence. So I talked about God's silence as the earth's presence, which is Heidegger's vision. Like for Heidegger, Nietzsche's atheism is two-sided because that nothing of God is not an inert nothing. It's also like, it's a nothing, an active inchoate glimmering of future possibilities. So that's to just address your first point. Go ahead and hit me with your second one if you want. Okay, what I, what I had seen, what I, I kind of seen him going is like uh, the, the point of no return is when human is crosses, they're talking about digitizing consciousness. And I, I see that as kind of where that it's going. This, uh, uh, like we're extending ourselves. I like to think of it as like going on a spaceship the further away you go, the more you have to create Earth in itself, like a separate Earth. You become less Earthling and more this man-made creation separate from Earth. You become this new being of this artificial planet kind of thing. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's what I saw. Like that darkest part is where. Yeah, I've taught. I've I've addressed. I agree with that too. I've addressed that in a paper called um, "Against Immortality: Colon." why death is better than the alternative, which is an argument against the desirability of immortality. So, which is, you know, it's, it's very being in time informed. It's this idea that it's our terror of dying that's motivating our flight away from authenticity, our flight away from owning our, the meaning of our lives in their finitude. Mm -hmm. um, I'm about, in my Phil Lit class, I'm about to end the semester talking about Don DeLillo's Zero K, which is a fascinating exploration of this vision of rich people trying to live forever by uploading their consciousness onto the internet. But I, this year watched um, Altered Carbon, which I highly recommend, my students recommend it to me and I watched it, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really wonderful um, mm -hmm. dystopian exploration of this, of the kinds of possible futures that we are, mm -hmm. um, as you say, extending ourselves into. In yeah. all cases, um, think of the Altered Carbon one, What's happening with this extension of life beyond, you know, the indefinitely, at least, if not infinitely, is a um, loss of meaning. People are losing in, in these move in the in um, zero K altered carbon, the central pro protagonist, these figures who are either striving for achieving or have already achieved a kind of endless life extension are the ones who are getting bored, tired, like exploring ever more extreme, violent, and uh, sexual lifestyles in order to try and eke out some glimmer of uh, stimulation to make them feel like life has a purpose. 
So yeah, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very sympathetic to these ideas. They're all ways of extending what Heidegger's talking about as the greatest greatest danger. And then the trick is to try and think about how we might have a photographic negative of those very same views that would lead us out of nihilism. Okay, and so. I my yeah. other my other point was uh, the the parallel with the technology, with capital, and the the inframing of everyone as a commodity. Uh, um, yeah, the way we have been subsumed into our own economic engine, and the um, the, the other thing that I thought of is, is the further away we go from being human, uh, yeah. the more divorced we are with the effects uh, and the costs of becoming less human. So we take a drug to handle uh, combat trauma to, and then become, it becomes that much easier to go into war. Um, that is the effect. We, we don't see the, the cost of those actions. And yeah. that's basically where, what I wanted to talk about. That's well, deep. I've had several um, master's students who have you know, come back. Basically, one guy wrote his uh, MA thesis on Heideggerian death and PTSD after seeing three of his best buddies blown up in a in a you know improvised explosive device um yeah i think there's plenty of people leave, living um with ptsd if not everybody it's, it's i often think these are just issues of degree rather than um a kind of a either or mm -hmm. and, uh, but i agree with that i can i can talk about capital i think heidegger's um he's a, crit a critic of marx because marx is for him too much of a materialist He's, it's Marx thinks you can um, isolate one domain of entities, the economic, and then generalize from that domain to all other domains. Whereas Heidegger's view is that there's no one privileged domain of entities from which we can understand what it means to be a thing. So when Nietzsche is looking at economics, he's doing it alongside also looking at biology, also looking at chemistry, and then finding a vision of what it means to be that permeates all those domains. So that's what Heidegger's interested in. And he thinks the Nietzschean is still true of all the different domains, including the Marxist. So for the Marxist, um, reality is nothing but endless forces coming together and, and competing against each other. I'm a big fan of Marcuse, who's a kind of Heideggerian Marxist, who was kind of a Heidegger with a smiling face, who was, he was a guru of the new left. And um, one of the guys who I went to UCSD pursuing his trail. He was very interested in the way in which technological automation frees us from some of the most dehumanizing jobs there are. I mean, I used to look at the people working at the uh, toll booths and think that looks like the worst job ever. I'm asthmatic, et cetera. And like the idea of breathing, you know, car exhaust all day is like torture to me. And I'm looking at these people, I'm sure it shortened their lives to have to, you know, breathe that stuff. Now it's, you know, use a card or throw your money in a thing. Same with the, it's not fully automated yet, but I, am I at all worried that like human jobs are being lost to, for toll takers? Not a bit. Like for me, every job that can be automated should be, because those are the crap jobs, which I had working at, you know, at Burger King, et cetera. Those are not jobs that, you know, give you any kind of sense of the dignity of the human being in my experience. So it's the, we just need to free ourselves from the idea that human beings need to earn money to uh, have meaningful lives. I'm a big fan of some sort of universal income plan that would allow people to work if they want to work, enter the, you know, enter the job force if they, if they want more money, but otherwise to have enough money to be able to get by, do creative projects, to do whatever kind of spiritual or, or uh, artistic or uh, theatrical exploration that they, they want to do. I think that's the most sane <laughs> proposal I've seen on the horizon. Yeah. So, um, since we're talking about the virtual, or I don't know if we still are, but I just kind of on the virtual through okay. the virtual. <laughs> no. um, it kind of occurred to me that this nothing or the whatever not thing, um, that verbing right of nothingness. Yeah. It, is that does that correlate at all with the concept of of loss or? Um, I don't know, we don't probably want to get into Lacan, but like the cut of the reel, like that sort of thing where there's, I, I'm asking this because I wonder sometimes if what makes video games or virtual reality or a lot of these things um, 
less real is that you can start over again and again and again. Like there's a, there it, like how, what can the virtual maybe perhaps reach this point where people are trying to make it so real that they realize they have to integrate loss into it and it actually becomes a mode of, of processing our, our previous loss of um, maybe like some parts of the natural world or whatever. That's uh, good. Yeah, contrast. Um, what's the Tom Cruise movie where he gets to restart every time he dies? And gets all what is it? Mission Impossible. It's, it's a, Oblivion. Oh. Oblivion. Thank you, oh, Oblivion. Oh, 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 it's, it? it's basically Groundhog Day as action film. And oh, yeah. uh, contrast that with uh, Sword Art Online, or yes. uh, Sword Art. Sword Art Online is a really brilliant anime, or um, even better is um, Hunter Hunter or Hunter x Hunter, as it's written, which is, in my opinion, the best anime yet, which one of the seasons they're trapped in a virtual game where if they die, they really die, which is what inspired Sword Art Online. So in both cases, they're young people living in a, in a video game that's where death is real. Yep. And, and it's quite fascinating how they explore that idea. In terms of Lacan, I mean, Lacan is a Heideggerian. He translated Heidegger's Anaximander fragment into French. He was in constant dialogues with Derrida, who's sort of the leading French Heideggerian. Um, the difference is that Lacan's also a, a Marxist. And um, I'm sorry, he's also a Freudian. And Freud is a modern thinker for whom meaning comes from subjects projecting it onto inherently value-free objects. So in that sense, value is a kind of, um, it's something we trick ourselves into thinking we're discovering outside ourselves. That's commodity fetishism. I think that, you know, the, that car is really desirous and, and uh, incredible, but really I've just bought into a whole system of signifiers that's, that's tricked me into believing that. I bought into that worldview. Heidegger's view is that there are things that that critique of value applies to, specifically money and fungible, interchangeable commodities. But there are also things that are invaluable, that literally can't be quantified. And those non-quantifiable qualities are um, the truly meaningful things in life. They're the things around which we should build our lives. So there's a, you know, there's a famous joke about, um, who is it, Churchill, Winston Churchill at a, at a dinner party turns supposedly to the woman next to him and says, um, Madam, would you sleep with me for a million dollars? And she says, oh, oh why? Yes, uh, Winston. And he says, well, how about then for a dollar? And she says, what do you think I am? And he says, well, we've established that, Madam. Now we're just dickering over the price. <laughs> the idea is, is there, an, like, is there an amount of money that you would um, allow someone to pay you to torture your mother or you know your child. <laughs> if there is, that's a bad sign of you know your relation to your mother or your child. There are things in this life that there's no that are invaluable. They're not quantifiable. There's no amount. Uh, they're not fungible. They don't enter into the order of the commodity. And it's not just because of, uh, as Lacan thought, some sort of founding libidinal investment around which the entire system of our um, signifiers is built, arguably. That's the big difference is from Heidegger's perspective, Lacan's a nihilist, as is Freud, as is Marx, because they're overly committed to this modern subjective view that all meaning comes from human subjects, imposing it onto an inherently meaningless objective world. For Heidegger, if you think of meaning in terms of values that subjects impose onto meaningless objects, then you're living in nihilism. Instead, we have to be open to the significance of the reality outside ourselves and creatively and selectively disclose that reality in order to lead lives of enduring meaning. If anybody else has it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so can we so, switch? Oh, go ahead. But someone so well, I'll just interject and say we have uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. But, um, who is this? Scantac has two questions too. Who is this? Yeah, go real quick and then. That's Michael. Michael, yeah. Hi. So, if we only have twenty minutes left, then let's uh, just stick to one really, really quick question. Uh, did you say somewhere that uh, Heidegger said that an owning is uh, somehow like diametrically or antithetical to inframing? 
It's the photographic negative. The photo, okay, yeah, the photographic negative of in framing as uh, as a mode of disclosure. Yeah. Because to be sure, I'm working through the the contributions right now. Um, in owning is a mode of disclosure, right? Or is it is it like what Heidegger thinks he's uh, he's this for, is your for Heidegger? <laughs> sorry, I said this is your small question. Yeah, no, in um, owning. Eragnus is a huge, huge topic in Heidegger. There's not one thing that it means. He initially introduces it as die agentliche Eragnus. He uses the word in 1919 in a different way. It's not the same word. It's not the same idea. When he mm -hmm. introduces it in it before, I think it's maybe just right before the Beiträge, it's the moment when human beings start grasping reality conceptually. The Angriff. So uh, it's like the, uh, I think my translation says inceptual. Uh, inceptual, anfanglicher. That's right. Like, and I don't have the German for for that one. Uh, it's incept is anfang. It's okay. it's a nice translation. So it's um it's like catching being in the fangs of time. Before that, being just happened, and it was never you know it didn't get caught up and and repeated, and, and it didn't iterate as Derrida would say. It didn't. Um, get congealed into um, constellations of intelligibility. So there's some moment, this is what Derrida calls the historicity of historicity. There's some moment when being enters into time and it's a kind of mythical moment. We can't date it. It's a mistake to think it happened with Anaximander or something. It didn't happen with the Egyptians. It, you know, it, it, it's before recorded history because it's the moment of it when intelligibility takes place. It probably happened all over the place in lots of different ways before it caught, caught on. <laughs> but that's the first way he uses it. But by the later um, work, the event becomes um, the way in which being as such erupts into the order of the being of entities. So for us, the way we understand the being of entities is through Nietzsche's ontotheology of eternally recurring will to power. That is, we see all things technologically. So the event is when being as such, or being as what overflows any way of understanding it, erupts into this understanding of all things as meaningless stuff to be optimized. So that happens all the time. When you see a, something that isn't useful to you, when you see something that's meaningful but doesn't fit into your attempt to like be more efficient and more streamlined and get more for less. One yes, of Heidegger's yes. favorite examples is like a, a, fall, a fall tree exploding with um, red foliage, which, by the way, comes back to the uh, <laughs> this this point that for him, there's something beautiful about our finitude. Like we we tend to think of finitude as tragic, as something to be overcome that science has to finally beat by allowing us to live forever. But I think for Heidegger, the significance of finitude is that as long as we're finite, there's always more to see. So as long as humans are finite, there will always be more new, interesting things to disclose. There will always be meaning. Whereas if we become infinite, all bets are off. Uh, and thank you very much for clarifying the point about the last God or that only a God can save us, rather. Yeah. Uh, something that's, I you know. Um, if, if you look at Heidegger Art and Postmodernity, Chapter 7, I give the um, textual references that show that that's what he means. And it's... it's um, yeah, there's a lot A lot of Heideggerians have drunk the anti-Heidegger Kool-Aid, that that's this moment of like despair where Heidegger is looking out the world and thinking we can't do anything. All we can do is prepare for the possibility of a transformation. He does mean we can prepare for the possibility of a global, worldwide, new way of understanding what it means to be. That's what he dedicates his whole life to, is the postmodern understanding sweeping the globe. That's never happened yet, and gets to the earlier issue about where are we in history. And I mean, one possibility is that we are in the greatest danger, this kind of moment of, you know, Trump as the embodiment of inframing, where, you know, maybe this will be like the popping of a boil that will lead to something better. I have trouble. Somebody pops that being boil. optimistic, but yeah. <laughs> I've got a question, uh, yeah. probably a, a big question, but I, I just am interested to know this is so issues that I'm really fascinated with with Heidegger scholarship. I guess I guess maybe I'm the only one calling it this, but the the Sheehan versus Capobianco debate 
uh, on the meaning of being is being just meaning like Sheehan says, or I guess you could expand it to Dreyfus about background familiarity, intelligibility, or like Kava Bianco is arguing, Heidegger shifts later on and it really, he's talking about the very, I guess we would almost call it the materialist production of beings in space and time. Yeah. And I'm really interested because I think Kava Bianco, he, you know, the sources uh, he points out, it seems that Heidegger is saying that, that he's not reducing it to meaning or intelligibility at certain points. And, you know, almost to borrow Brentano's type, Senses of being in Heidegger, and yeah. it it seems yeah, exactly. in keeping with the very idea that being can't be reducible. So I just was interested in what your take on that issue is. Good. Yeah, yeah. So I think Sheehan and Capo Bianco are both very brilliant <laughs> scholars, but they're both wrong on this issue. So and they're wrong in an interesting. I mean, I would say Sheehan's more wrong than Capo Bianco. But they're both, I mean, in a way, Capo Bianco has allowed himself to buy into Sheehan's underlying presupposition in a way that's blocked him from seeing the, uh, what I would call the sublation or the way out of this debate. So what, to, for those who don't know what he's, Michael's talking about, there's a big debate on like this Heidegger online chat forum kind of thing. So it's the virtual Heidegger. And um, I think people who participate in this think it's a big deal, and maybe it is. Maybe if enough people think it's a big deal, it becomes a big deal. But it's something like, is did Heidegger, the Sheehan version is, Heidegger always meant the same thing by being. He just used a lot of different words for it. It's always the same. And Capo Bianco rightly points out that that is just not true, that something very profound happened around 29 and into the 30s where Heidegger came to realize that there was more to being than the being of entities. The problem is that Campo, Campo Bianco doesn't take the further step and realize that Heidegger actually changed his mind and used a different word, nothing, earth, being as such. These are words for what is not the being of entities, but goes beyond the being of entities. So Campo Bianco is right. There's something beyond the being of entities that makes the being of entities possible. And the being of entities is what shapes sense, intelligibility, etc. So there's something beyond sense, intelligibility that shapes these different historical epochs of truth or disclosure. And that's being as such, the nothing, etc. But it is partly experienceable. So you can't say it's completely beyond sense or intelligibility, whatever your preferred terminology is, because the nothing nuffs. That is, it does something. It makes itself felt. It enters into the order of intelligibility. It impinges in a way that we can pick up on the significance of. I don't know if, if Richard would, I think he'd probably agree with that. Um, I think it's very misleading because Heidegger himself doesn't want to admit that he radically changed his mind from being in time, but he did. He, in being in time, he can't imagine this horizon beyond the being of entities that he'll later think of as the nothing or being as such. So it's there is definitely something beyond the being of entities. Sheehan's wrong about that. Heidegger does not mean the same thing his whole life. He radically transforms his view. To come back to your very first question about the turn, this is the turn is a response to how, given that now I can't just in philosophy explain what the being of entities is, that's a project of being in time. I'm going to explain fundamental ontology or the meaning of being in general. I'll clarify what being in general means. And I'll finally have answered the question that we've been wondering about since Aristotle and that I've been asking since 1909, Heidegger's thinking, when you know he got that book, The Multiple Senses of Being in Aristotle from his headmaster at the at the Con Conradin Gruber, I guess it was in, was it Con, uh, Gr whatever his first name is, Gruber. And um, he comes to realize there's something, the being, being as such, which is, and he, keeps using different names for it because these different names, some work for some people, some work for others. You know, I mean, I, I've tried to show, for example, how in this, I don't know if you guys can see the famous Van Gogh painting, that out of the uh, shoes, there is a farming woman coming forth. That for 80 years, Heideggerians have read this, te this test, writers, this text, where Heidegger is talking about the farming woman and have failed to realize that Heidegger is suggesting that there is literally, phenomenologically, a farming woman stepping forth from those shoes into the intelligible world, and that that's the sense in which the Van Gogh painted Alithea. He painted the tension of earth and world. He painted truth happening. 
he painted the nothing nothing and heidegger as he says in the black notebooks didn't tell people he he left it mysterious he adds all these hints about there's a riddle here and i'm not telling you the riddle the secret is just to see the riddle but it's still for 80 years nobody <laughs> figured out what he was talking about so. <laughs> I often feel, I mean, there's a lot of Heidegger people out there who don't realize that you can't understand technology without understanding ontotheology. But Heidegger's critique of technology comes out of his view of ontotheology, specifically thinking of reality in terms of Nietzsche's ontotheology is what he means by technology. That's the negative technologization he's trying to get us out of. Lots of people don't understand <laughs> what he means by God. Lots of people don't understand, you know, what it, the God that can save us. That's another understanding of being, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting to me how rudimentary Heidegger scholarship still is. It's really in its kind of first steps. It spent the first 30 or 40 years just trying to translate the texts and agree on a terminology and clarify a few basic things. And it's now slowly, you know, <laughs> working outside that into and as ideas get clarified, often analytic philosophers come and take them and run with them. <laughs> That's, I think, how Heidegger's getting digested and disseminated throughout the philosophical world. There's lots of uh, analytic philosophers taking and making a career off sort of one idea in Heidegger. <laughs> Sorry, uh, someone had a question there. Uh, yeah, oh, because you brought up the ontotheology again. And um, yeah. I'm not sure if my understanding is, is right on that, um, but... Uh, to my mind, um, um, onto theology um, is sort of like conceiving of um, of God or the con okay, so like conceiving the being of beings as a being, or conceiving the being of beings as an entity, but like the infinite entity, uh, and, and that different than a being as such, and actually the onto theological view as. Uh, a characteristic and symptomatic of the forgetting of being as disclosure um is is that the case or or no, no, um, does, does this have yeah, to do with heidegger changing maybe his mind of of no. different kinds of of being did he evolve into like a like a pluralism more like as he as as he um advanced yeah so that's the old misunderstanding of onto theology that was dominant among like caputo and those guys 30 years ago so it reduces onto theology to about one quarter of what onto theology is about so onto theology has two sides the onto and the theo and then there's a way in which the onto and the theo connect and that's what that's about so part of onto theology is like understanding the creator god as the highest embodiment of an entity so they talk about leibniz um, or even Nietzsche, the eternal return as the highest, the closest that becoming comes to being. So it's important, it's important for understanding that um, ontology and theology are interconnected in ontotheology. They feed, there's a feedback loop between the two of them that, that whereby ontotheology is the microscopic. It's understanding like what everything shares in common. And that, that ontotheology, uh, sorry, ontology, what everything has in common, shapes our view of theology as the sort of ultimate or supreme instance of that kind of stuff that everything's joined by. That's the Theo. And then the Theo feeds back into the Onto by giving us a way of understanding what matters in the world, what's most important or significant, or if anything is. Often, usually, Onto theologies lead to a nihilism where nothing ends up mattering. So the view that Onto theology can be understood as thinking of God as the highest being is, a, it's like a C plus answer. It's a partial truth that's been substituted on the Wikipedias of the world for the real complicated view that for later Heidegger, ontotheology is sort of like the core idea motivating his critique of metaphysics. Metaphysics is ontotheology. You know, it's not, Nietzsche doesn't think of um, a creator God outside the world, but he does think of eternal return as. Um, the way in which constant becoming, the closest a universe of constant becoming, like a Heraclitean river of permanent becoming, comes to being. Because if you imagine the eternal return of the same, stick to the same for a sec, if you imagine this universe being born, dying, born, dying, endlessly in an in a unchanging pattern of constant transformation, that one pattern, that endless loop, 
from outside looks like a sameness, hence eternal return of the same, right? So that you can see that river as a kind of the closest becoming comes to being. Okay, I certainly, I see a bit more now. I talk about this in the final section of chapter one on Heidegger art and postmodernity. That's where I kind of explain why that reading is only partly right. Uh, Thank you very much. Sure. We gotta get to Josh here. Do we have enough time? Yeah, we got time. Okay, this is this will be a quick question, I think, on my end. Um, Do you think uh, machines that are intelligent can have consciousness, and why not? Do you have a, do you? <laughs> uh, yes. What's an example of an intelligent machine? Uh, well, we don't have one yet, but I think that I can take uh, That's what I meant. Do you think they're intelligent? Do you mean, do I think they could become intelligent? I think that machines are certainly intelligent now, and whether or not they're conscious is a different... Uh, I see. Kind so of what do you mean by intelligent? Like ratiocinators? Um, they time- can... Calculate? No, I don't know. I don't know what those things mean. I mean, like telling the temperature, you know, having neural networks in the case of your iPhone or something. Uh huh. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a metaphorical use of intelligence that isn't what we really mean by intelligence. At least, I mean, they do impressive things. <laughs> but um, Heidegger distinguishes between calculative thinking and meditative thinking. And for him, calculative thinking is a thinking that takes the ends as fixed and then gives you the quickest, fastest means to those ends. It's what the Frankfurt School called substantive rationality. If you think of like Google uh, Maps telling you how to get home, it'll show you the fastest route. It won't show you the most beautiful route. It won't show you the route where you're most likely to encounter an unexpected uh, event that might transform your life forever but it will show you the uh, route calculated to minimize traffic and maximize, maximize your uh, TV watching time when you get home. But that, anyway, whether they'll do that one day, they're already doing that, I agree with you. They're at least calculating things at rates that far exceed what humans can do. But meditative thinking, that is the ability to um, creatively disclose the hints that reality offers us. I don't know, that seems more complicated to me. I've seen things about Google dreaming I don't know, I, I was actually talking with Terry Winograd a couple of weeks ago, who he was the head of the lab at Stanford where Google was created. And we were talking about um, Google, Google's dreams and he doesn't understand it. So <laughs> it's not clear to me that anyone, you know, there might be, there's probably somewhere a couple of people who know what, what's going on in those sort of things. But I come out of a school that's very suspicious. It's Dreyfus's, Dreyfus's great claim to fame. The reason you had this crazy Heideggerian teaching at Berkeley was because he showed that um, good old fashioned AI, GoFi, was a failed project, that it always constantly claimed that it was going to, um, five, 10 years from now, it would be doing everything a human could do. And he pointed out all these deep philosophical problems for it. And the current versions of AI have responded to those critiques and come up with much better ways around them, following a lot of his suggestions about how you needed embodiment combined with learning neural networks and this sort of thing. So will those happen? Um, Maybe. And if so, then Nietzsche was right. And uh, as he said in Zarathustra, I come to teach the Superman. Humanity is something that shall be superseded. Ask yourself, what have you done today to supersede him? That's the view that we should get out of the way of evolution and let the computers take over. They're going to be better than us. Our only job now is to kind of like get them through their infancy and just get out of their way. Let them wipe us out or whatever, or take care of us. And I, for me, I'm not a Nietzsche and I find all those scenarios highly implausible and dystopian. I think we have barely even under, begun to understand the brain. We've barely even begun mapping it, let alone understanding how to replicate it in a, you know, in a computer. So I think all of this stuff is highly, highly speculative. And I'm very suspicious when people say, Oh, the singularity is coming. Soon the computers will be able to do. It's, it, that's complete garbage. The, the idea that a, com, you know, that a computer will become conscious the moment it has the same number of, uh, of neurons as a human brain is a massive non sequitur. So I don't, the singularity is a weird kind of religious fantasy for um, computer atheists. I don't know what's going on there. I think no one would take it seriously if it wasn't being propounded by a, a professor at Oxford. But, you know, I think weird things happen. 
Thanks. But tell us what you really think, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> so we just got to the the time. Cool. I uh, I wanted to to say thank you for being our standing reserve on call of uh, of standing reserve of Heidegger answers on call. I wa I wasn't that, and I and I won't be that. But <laughs> I, will, I will continue to um, provoke you to think. I hope. That's all I can hope to do. But yeah, when you come to me looking for me to optimize your pre-existing ideas, as my students have discovered, I usually don't, I don't function very well in that role. <laughs> I'm much better at giving people headaches. <laughs> well, usually they're productive ones. Yes, I really appreciate a good headache. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. This was Somebody... Somebody complained to Heidegger that his thinking gave them a headache, and he said there are not enough such headaches in the world today. I really, I really do think this will be a fast one, and I'm going to get it in there because it's been bothering me since you said it, and I think I might even know the answer, but I just figured, hey, let's do this for the good of the group. <laughs> said a great thinker. What's a great thinker? How do you know? So a great thinker for Heidegger is a thinker who transforms our understanding of being. So for him, Kierkegaard, who's probably the most influential thinker on him, is not a great thinker because Kierkegaard's thinking doesn't transform what it means to be. Teaches Heidegger profound, important existential and phenomenological lessons, but unlike Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Descartes, Nietzsche, he doesn't transform humanity or Western humanity's understanding of isness or the being of entities. So for Heidegger, a great thinker is a metaphysician. That's the, that's the irony there, because he'll, stu he'll soon specifically reject philosophy, the word philosophy, as being uh, monopolized by metaphysics. And when he starts trying to get beyond metaphysics or beyond ontotheology, which is what that means, he calls the attempt to think beyond ontotheology or beyond philosophy thinking. So the irony is that what he earlier <coughs> calls a great thinker is a great metaphysician. It's an ontotheologist who transforms humanity's understanding of what it means to be. So the greatest thinkers ever are, you know, um, Descartes and Jesus. They're the ones who most profoundly transform humanity. And then after them, it's basically Nietzsche. Because Ka all Kant does, in Heidegger's view, is think Descartes unthought. That is, Kant takes this insight that the human being is a, is a center of um, immediate self-aware certitude, and ask the question, okay, given that indubitable truth, what would it be like to treat every human like that ethically? How do we organize politically such that we respect the rational agency of each point of certitude like that? So Kant just thinks the unthought of Descartes. Then Nietzsche, for Heidegger, thinks the unthought of Kant because Kant accidentally, or perhaps unconsciously, if you're a Freudian, killed God. He, he thought he was doing it to make room for faith, but what he showed was that human beings can't get from the physical to the metaphysical. They can't secure this experiential world in some ultimate reality outside or, or within it once and for all. So Kant, I mean, Nietzsche, when he says God is dead, he doesn't, he, he doesn't present himself as the person who came up with that. He's Remember, the madman comes with the truth to the marketplace that's happened from you know, far away in a distant star that hasn't reached humanity yet. That's Kant on my reading. So Heidegger takes himself to be thinking Nietzsche's on thought. The way we get beyond this Nietzschean technological understanding is to think of Nietzsche not just as this eugenic philosopher who wanted to optimize Darwinian philosophy, and if you read the, the notebooks, and, and treat human, you know, reshape humanity the way an artist sculpts clay, as Nietzsche said, but rather as someone who glimpsed um, reality as a nothing, and if we can see that nothing not as nothing at all, but as the inchoate hints of the future waiting to arrive, then we're already beyond late modernity into the beginning of the postmodern. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very much. <laughs> I'll be here on that. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, how do I hang up? All right. <laughs> all right. Have a good one. Yeah, take care. Right. Good night, everybody. Thank you.